Dare to go forward in your life. Dare to go forward in the direction of fulfilling your potential. I've, I, I, when I was, many years ago, I was a karate student. I was also a karate instructor. And I competed in three international championships. And one of the things that I learned from my best karate instructors, and I studied under six world champions, is they told me that when you fight, always move forward. Even if you're only moving forward half an inch at a time, just always move forward. He said, when you're moving forward, 100% of your attention is forward. But if you're moving backward, even a half an inch at a time, half of your attention is always behind you and where you're going. So always move forward. Always have a, dare to go forward. Whenever you have a choice of either staying still and playing it safe or moving forward, move forward. Not because you'll necessarily succeed every time, because it reinforces and cements the habit of moving forward. And most people, when they have a choice of moving forward, or staying, playing it safe, play it safe. But I think General MacArthur, Doug, General Douglas MacArthur said, there's no security in life, only opportunity. Life is very perverse in a way because the more we seek security, the less we have it. And the more we seek opportunity, the more we have security. Helen Keller said this beautifully. She said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. That the tendency, she said in the earlier parts of this statement, she said the tendency to seek security is the low road to failure. That courage is absolutely essential. And one of the things that I, I used to think that if you were really courageous, eventually you got to the point where you weren't afraid. I'm going to tell you something, that if you're not a little bit afraid, at least three or four nights a week, you're not trying hard enough. If you're not falling on your face over and over again, if you're not trembling when you go to sleep with your heart pounding, if then what is happening is you're not trying hard enough. You're living too far within your potential. That all really successful people live on the outside edge of what they're capable of. And it's always a little bit scary on the outside edge because we all have feelings of uncertainty. We all have fears. We all have doubts that hold us back. But the brave person is simply the person who moves forward and keeps taking the chance. And you cannot imagine a successful pe person without courage. You cannot imagine a successful person without the courage to face and confront their fears and to move forward. In my experience, the fear of failure is the greatest single reason for failure in adult life. The fear of failure, the fear of making a mistake, of losing our money, our time, our effort, is what paralyzes us and holds us back. But the fear of failure is a habit which can be counteracted by the habit of courage. And if we don't overcome that fear of failure, then we'll just be like the 80-90% that do not fulfill their potential. See, the wonderful thing is only a few percentage of people fulfill their potential in any generation. And we can join those people simply by deciding to do so and doing what the other people do. It's as simple as that. If we decide to become an engineer, what do you study? You study engineering. If you want to become a better cook, what do you do? You study cooking. Do you try to do it all by yourself? No, you get cookbooks, you take classes, and so on and so forth. If you want to be successful, if you want to fulfill your potential, study the men and women who are fulfilling their potential and just do what they do. Your self-esteem is largely determined by the gap between your self-image and your self-ideal. And is it contracting and getting smaller? Then your self-esteem is high. If it's getting wider because you fell off the wagon, you did or said something you know, that you don't, you're not happy about, you know, that's not me then your self-esteem will go down. So striving to be like your ideal causes your self-esteem and self-confidence to go up. And then when somebody gives you a compliment that, that is consistent with your being a better person, then you really feel happy because you really feel that you're moving toward that great goal. So the stages of changing your self-concept are, number one, the change must be perceived by you as being both desirable and necessary. Remember we said before changing a light bulb, the light bulb has to really want to change. Well, for you to change, you must consider it to be desirable, is something that you want, and necessary. This is something I need to do if I'm really going to realize my potential. And so if your self-concept, uh, you want to have a self-concept of a well, very well-controlled and organized, positive person, you say, this is something that's essential if I'm going to be, achieve maximum influence in my circle, or even become a great salesperson. If your self-concept is you want to be very well-organized, and you need to be well organized to be successful in a competitive business, then uh, you consider it to be both, be both desirable and necessary. And that's the motive force that drives you. Number two is begin thinking about yourself as you would like to be. Sort of turn it over in your mind. Um, John Asaroff, who you see tomorrow, great guy, he, 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 he's done a program which he'll tell you about. It's called, it was called The Inner Game of Financial Success. And um, he got a call from a man named Timothy Galway. And Timothy Galway, 30 years ago, I read the book, wrote a book called uh, Inner Tennis. And he's also written Inner Golf. And what he says, which is completely consistent with what we are learning here, 
what he said is if you want to be a better tennis player, imagine that you were a world champion tennis player already. Just imagine you're a world champion. As you move, as you swing the racket, you've seen them on television, just act as though, and think, I'm a world champion. And think of how you would act if you're a world champion. And surprise, surprise, your performance actually improves. You actually play better tennis, just playing with the idea that you're a world champion. And if you're a world cha if you want to be a better golfer, then, then play with the idea that I'm already a great golfer. I am a great golfer. And just imagine, this is what you uh, like, just imagine that you're already a great golfer and you actually end up playing better golf. It's called, he calls it the inner, uh, the inner game of tennis, the inner game of, of golf. And it's the same thing with you. When you imagine yourself as already excellent at what you want to do. The changing your self-concept, we say in your self-concept, the self-ideal is a combination of all the qualities of all the men and women you've admired throughout your life. Which, of course, if you read lots of biographies and autobiographies of men and women who are worthy uh, of reading, as opposed to drunken rock stars and things like that, but when you read about Madame Curie or Thomas Edison or uh, Mother Teresa, when you read stories about men and women who have done wonderful things with their lives, and all of them from humble beginnings, you start to think, oh, I'd like to, I'd, that, I'd like to be that way. And when you read about their qualities and how they persisted, you start to absorb through, your, through the skin being like that when the condition requires it. When the situation requires it, yes, I'll be courageous too, and I'll be determined too, and I will be cheerful as well. So the more you read about people, the more you form a higher and better and, and clarified ideal. So this, this becomes your internal role model. And there's always this dynamic tension between the person you are and the person you would like to be. A person who thinks that they've all, they're already fine is not a person who's really open to any improvement. And people who think that they're already fine are usually people that are not really that admirable. Because every admi admirable person you'll ever meet thinks that they could be much better than they are. They could do much better. They always feel that I could be much more successful than this, or a better person, or I could be more compassionate and more patient and more loving. Even though other people think, geez, you're doing very well, they always compare themselves against an ever higher standard, which means that they're always in this state of dynamic tension toward becoming better and better and better. Uh, when you admire these people, you have an unconscious tendency to be more like them. And that's why it's important that you think and talk about people that you admire. The great tragedy for many young people today is that they admire divas and rock stars and basketball players and dancers with the idols. Those are the people they admire. And you can tell who they admire by who they, who they watch, who they tweet, who they look at, uh, who they replay, who they discuss, and so on. And that's not really very healthy because these people uh, are not good role models for young people. They're not good role models. I have had my life so profoundly and positively changed by role models, mostly men who kind of took me under their wing when I was growing up and coming from a lousy home. And they became role models to me as even, this, even to this day, decades later, I can remember still wanting to be someone that they would approve. Uh, Somerset Mom was once asked why he wrote so prolifically, and he had a beautiful line, which I think applies to life. He said, I write to earn the respect of the people I respect. And what I have found is that that's what we do in life, is we do the things we do to earn the respect of the people we respect, and at least not to lose their respect. And many of us would go through tremendous privations and sacrifices not to lose the respect of someone whose respect we value. And so thinking about whose respect you value is a really important point. Who is really important in my life? Who do I really respect? And then you think, what would I need to do or not do to earn or to keep this person's respect? And you don't even have to know them. They just can, they can be people who are people that are very admirable. Guard your integrity as a sacred thing. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing at last is sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Never compromise your integrity for anything and never compromise your peace of mind for anything. You see, compromising your peace of mind is a way of compromising your integrity. Never do anything that disrupts your peace of mind. If it makes you feel unhappy, get out of it. Don't stay in relationships, don't stay in jobs, don't stay in situations that cause your peace of mind to be disrupted because your peace of mind is the highest good that you have. And a person who practices consistency consistently structures their life so what they are doing is being true to themselves. What they are doing is living up to the very best that is in them as a human being. And that takes tremendous courage.
It takes tremendous courage because it's so easy to go along with the crowd. But you'll never be really happy unless you know that you are being true to yourself uh, and completely true to yourself. Begin to visualize and create clear mental pictures. A visualized picture is, is a command to your subconscious mind and when you visualize yourself performing at your best, your subconscious mind organizes your behaviors and actions on the outside so they're consistent with the picture that you just fed. It's almost like the picture is the command or the seed and your subconscious mind is the garden. And what it does is the subconscious mind grows the behavior that you visualize. All the work on self-image psychology is really exciting. Visualize yourself as positive and confident. Visualize yourself as successful. Visualize yourself as happy. And what happens is you begin to behave on the outside, consistent with that picture, but it's natural. You feel natural with the new behavior. Practice your visualization over and over again, because every time you visualize, as we said, every time you visualize, your subconscious takes it as a new command, like you just did it again. You just performed excellently again and you just keep replaying the picture. Before every event of importance, you'll find that success, well, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself. Your, your image must be clear, vivid, and exciting. That means the greater clarity your picture of yourself performing or your picture of yourself in the future, the faster it comes into your reality. Vividness is the most important thing of all. That's why if you go and see a house or take pictures of a house and take those pictures and put them where you can see them, uh, read Architectural Digest, which has beautiful homes, or Homes Beautiful, or uh, Sunset Home and Garden, Beautiful Homes and Garden, and read those pictures so you feed your mind with these photographs, almost like, like feeding them into your mental computer, then your mental computer strives to put you into the kind of home that you desire. Assume the role. Act as if you were already the person you wish to be. Walk and talk and act. I tell salespeople, if you really want to be impressive, when you go in to see a client, imagine that you are extremely wealthy. You're worth $100 million. But one of your hobbies is calling on people for a friend of yours who owns a company. So you like to, you like to make sales calls because you just sort of like getting out there and getting among them. And so you walk in as though you're worth $100 million and just could not care less whether this person buys or not. You really like to be able to talk to them and find out what their needs are and help them if you possibly can. Whether they buy or not, you couldn't care less because you're wealthy. You're just doing this you know, for a friend. And when you have this attitude, I'm already wealthy, it takes the desperation out of your voice. Especially if the business is bad and business is slow and you need the sale, you start to get a little bit desperate. There's a little edge in your voice and the customer says, ooh, na 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 Watch out here. Whereas when you're really relaxed and you don't really care if they say yes or no, you do care. I mean, that's clear because you've come, but you're not really upset about it or really concerned. They're much more likely to buy from you when you're more relaxed. So assume the role. Just act as if you were already the person. Uh, if you want to be popular, act as if you're already popular. Treat people as if you're already popular. Now, here's what we said before. The feelings will generate the actions just like as the actions generate the feelings. If you assume the role and walk and talk and act as if you're already the person you want to be, the feeling will generate the actions and you'll actually behave that way. And then as you behave that way, it'll generate the feelings. This principle of reversibility is very powerful. It's very powerful. Just act as if you are already successful. You can act your way into feeling by pretending that you have the quality already. We say, fake it until you make it. Because if you just pretend you have the quality within a matter of minutes, you'll start to feel the quality. If you pretend that you're confident, you'll start to feel confident. If you pretend that you're happy, you'll start to feel happy. Affirmations are, are strong, positive statements that you say to yourself and believe. The most powerful words in your world are the words you say to yourself and believe. With affirmations, your future potential is unlimited. In other words, you become what you say to yourself most of the time. If you say it over and over again, you program it deeper and deeper into your subconscious programming until it begins to appear in your reality. Like the gentleman who wrote down 101 goals. Every one of those goals appeared in his reality within 12 years, which is an incredible story, but it's not the only time I've heard that. These are based on the three Ps. Affirmations are, first of all, they must be personal. You always start an affirmation with the word I. I am, I earn, I achieve, I weigh. Second of all, 
Like, I like myself. I like myself. I like myself. Second of all, it must be positive. I am responsible. I am responsible. And third of all, it has to be present tense. I earn X number of dollars per year. I weigh X number of pounds. I drive such and such a BMW. I live in a 3,500 square foot custom made house. One of my graduates did exactly that when, before he changed jobs. He lost his job after the seminar, which he thought was a real bummer. And one of his goals was I live in a brand new 3,500 square foot custom designed home. Within 12 months, he had gone through two jobs, changed his income, increased his income, and he was closing on the house. He came back to my seminar a year later, he was closing on the house. And it was a custom designed, beautiful home that the builder had decided to sell rather than occupy himself. And so, does it work? Well, you know, never can be sure. But uh, what if it does? What if it does? So affirmations are powerful. Always speak to yourself in positive terms. When you write down your goals, you write them as affirmations. I earn this amount of money. I weigh this number of pounds. I uh, live in such and such a home. I uh, have such and such, a, I acquire or I achieve such and such a net worth, and so on. Verbalization, speaking your affirmation aloud. What we find is if you say something aloud, it has two or three times the impact as if you say it to yourself which is why you'll notice when football coaches are want to motivate the people, the players before the game, they said, okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna kill them, what are we gonna do? We're gonna kill them, what are we gonna kill them? And they, they get themselves pumped because when you say it aloud, you get yourself really more motivated than if you just whisper it to yourself. So standing in front of a mirror and reading your goals or, 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 or speaking out your verbalizations, I like myself, I like myself, I can do it, I can do it, I feel terrific. When you say it out loud, and you say it to other people. If anybody ever asks me, day or night, how do you feel? I always say I feel terrific. I feel terrific. I feel terrific. And even if I know, even when I was going through my cancer treatment last year, which is a very interesting experience, uh, when people say, how are you doing? I say, I feel terrific. I feel great. Everything's going great. Terrific. Terrific. Now, that might not have been completely true, but I was telling the truth in advance. You see, you don't have to be a quantum leap different from somebody else. You just have to be a little tiny bit different in the critical areas that make a difference. And you, get, you can achieve that simply by making it a goal, setting it as a goal, and working on it. You can become anything that you want to become. The harder you work, the better you get. The harder you work, the better you get. You know, in our society today, there's a lot of controversy over why should I work so hard for my job. The fact of the matter is that less than 5% really succeed. That's less than 5% of the population really succeed at life. Of 100 people working today, only one will be wealthy when they retire. Four will be financially independent, 15 will have some savings, 80% will be broke and dependent upon charities and pensions. Only one or two percent of people in each generation really makes it in life. And in every single study, those people who make it are those who work hard, hard, hard. And if you think that it's hard to be successful, try being a failure. Try coming to the end of the trail with no money, dependent upon pensions, and you don't know what hard is until you try living like that. But if you work hard, the average self-made millionaire in America works 12 to 13 hours a day. Works about 60 to 65 hours a week. I'll tell you this with regard to hard work, that you, in our society you only work eight hours a day for survival. Everything over eight hours is for success. And if you're only working eight hours a day, you're in trouble. If you're only working eight hours a day, you better have a rich uncle or you better have somebody else who's going to take care of you because eight hours a day only gets you survival in our society. Because it's so competitive that somebody else is working nine, they've got an edge on you. Somebody else is working ten, they've got a bigger edge on you. Every hour over eight that you invest is an investment in your future, is an investment in your success. And if you put in the hours over eight, whether it's studying or reading or working, if you put in the hours, it will pay off and it will pay off in spades. It's like throwing seed in the ground. When you throw a seed in the ground, the plant that comes up is not just one seed, it's hundreds of seeds. There's a crop that you put in, but you must put the seed in the ground first. If you do all the things that we've talked about, if you concentrate on becoming excellent, concentrate single-mindedly, be clear about your goals, consider other people, practice the golden rule, if you practice courage, if you practice consistency, if you practice all of these, then pretty soon you develop a level of self-confidence. See, confidence 
comes as a result. You don't get confidence out of a bottle, you don't get confidence from a pill. You can't learn confidence in a motivational seminar. You only get confidence by doing certain things over and over again that build a solid foundation within your own mind that you can do whatever you need to do, that you have what it takes to be successful.